All right, uh, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for coming to our second uh, breakout session of EastCon 20 Play On Breakout Sessions hosted by East. Uh, my name is Sarah Swisher. I'm the project coordinator at East. And my name is Melissa Clemens. I'm the student training coordinator at East and we are your moderators. Oh, Sarah, you're muted. Uh, we'll, we will be here to answer your questions in the chat um, and help troubleshoot any qu issues you may have um, while during the, mar the webinar. Um, take a moment to familiarize yourself with the options and the chat on your screen so you won't miss an opportunity to chime in. Most questions will be addressed at the end of the session during the Q&A. Yes, and if you have a question, uh, please put it in to the um, Q&A portion of the Zoom. So if you're unfamiliar with EAST but have chosen to tune in, thank you so much. Uh, here's a little bit about what we do. So EAST is an educational nonprofit headquartered in Little Rock, Arkansas. We put industry grade technology into classrooms so students could do service projects in their communities. With 259 programs spanning across Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Pennsylvania, we provide all learners with the opportunity to have relevant, individualized, and life-changing educational experiences. Joining us today is Colonel Anita Deason from Senator Bozeman's office. Colonel Deason served for over 33 years in the Arkansas and Ohio Army National Guard. She received numerous awards for her service, with the highest being the Legion of Merit. She currently serves as the military and veteran liaison for U.S. Senator John Bozeman. She travels the state visiting with military personnel, veterans, and family to assist them with their issues of concern. Today, Colonel Deason is here to talk with us um, about the Veterans History Project. Colonel Deason, are you ready to go? I'm ready. All right, take it away. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity from East. This is great. And also thanks for everybody tuning in today. Thank you for your interest in the, the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. And I hope you're, you're, you're staying safe, happy, and healthy out there. Um, the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, it was uh, started back in 2000. And it's part of the American Folk Life Center. And this project is for anyone age 15 and older. And we can talk more about younger students, how to get their involvement, but for those doing the actual interview, it's ages 15 and above. Uh, and it's for you to interview military veterans. So for the purposes of this project, a military veteran, the definition is anyone who has served in uniform at any point in time, for any length of service in any branch of service. So that includes National Guard and Reserves as well. Also in 2016, Gold Star family members uh, became eligible to participate in the Veterans History Project. But you, if you're interviewing a Gold Star family member, and those are family members who have lost someone in action. So if you interview, interview anybody who's a Gold Star family member, it needs to be the immediate next of kin of the Our Fallen Hero. So I'm gonna to talk to you a lot about um, the preparation to interview veterans or Gold Star family members for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. The better prepared you are, the better your interview will be. So first I would um, like to visit with you about uh, where you find veterans. And so most people know to reach out to their grandpa or their grandmother or parent. It's great. Your neighbor's great. You can find veterans at the church, uh, sometimes on your school faculty. Um, and if you, if you don't know about any of those, any veterans in those areas, then reach out to your local veterans like the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign War. Any, any organization such as, you don't have a veteran, give me a call 
we'll find you a veteran to interview. Any Arkansas has over 200,000 veterans in our state. So once you find your veteran that you would like to interview, I ask that you approach them and say something like, um, just always be respectful to our veterans, but ask them if they would give you the honor to allow you to interview them for the Library of Congress Veterans Hit Project. And then once they say yes, and most of them say, uh, then the next step would be, uh, in preparation would be considered a pre-interview. Now, I will share with you that World War II veterans right now are almost anybody I've ever talked to, they're ready, willing, and able to visit with you. They, they are ready to talk. Uh, Korean War veterans, some more are a little less to talk. You may have to do some convincing because our, our country did not treat them so well when they came back. We were not as appreciative of their service back then. They're a little more reluctant, but I've never had one turn me down that I asked, could I interview them? Of course, Desert Storm, um, Cold War era, everybody that served in uniform is eligible. Uh, so go ahead and, and make that question, ask question, Ken, may I have the honor to interview you? And from that point, you want to set up a pre-interview. You're not going to interview them. You're, you're just going to learn. And that, that can be done in there. It's most, usually most comfortable for them. It, it can be a pool. It can be wherever that veteran kind of chooses for that location to be. And think about during the pre-interview, you want to talk to your veteran about um, where let's 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 pretend it's going to be in their home so let's say they get up at 10 o'clock in the morning and you go there for the visit when you walk in that when in their home you need to have your production cap on like where if i'm producing a movie where's the best place to have it and usually a veteran would like to have you in their i love me room their office um, in their den, in their living room, sometimes at their kitchen table. So take a look at those locations and you want to think about things like lighting. Um, lighting is the most challenging portion of trying to set up for your interview. Uh, natural lighting is the best. Um, find a window where you can turn the chair around so lights come in on your veteran. That usually makes the best lighting. Um, overhead lighting and side lighting can be harsh or cause shadows, but you're going to, whatever you do is going to be good. Those are just things to think about. Um, if you do end up furniture around when you come back for the actual interview, you want to ask permission of your veteran to do that, or if they could have everything set up before you get there. So you're going to look for that place in their home to, to interview. What does the lighting look like? Next one to think about is what chair they're gonna sit in. And chairs matter because you need a comfortable chair for them to sit in because they're gonna be there for quite a while. So a comfortable padded chair, but you don't want the chair to be a rocking chair or a swivel chair because when they get a little nervous, they're gonna start rocking or swiveling. So a station. Um, some other things to think about and that you want to talk to your veteran about are, are what in their home is going to, or we're going to do the interview, what's going to make noises. So again, you're talking during the pre-interview about all these things, so it's easier during the interview. So you're going to want to tell them in advance about, you know, silencing the cell phone, maybe unplugging the landline if they still have a landline phone. What about clocks? Do they have grandfather clocks? Grandfather clocks sometimes uh, will 15 minutes. That's very distracting. Um, some of the homes have bird clocks. So you have a bird that chirps every on the hour. Things, do they have pets? Are they gonna have a barking dog somewhere that they may need to put in another room at the time of the interview? 
Now, if your veteran wants to have a pet in their lap while you're doing the interview, that's okay too. We can work with you. Another thing that will present challenges to you as an interviewer can be family and friends want to set in on the interview. And it's perfectly fine if that's what the veterans want. But the interview about the veteran, what does the veteran want? Does the veteran want their family in there or do they just want you and them in there? And the reason this uh, can present a pretty significant problem to you you is that sometimes want to participate in the interview and it's the interview again is just between you and the veteran also sometimes when the family or friends are in there um, the veteran will look to them um, for the income dependent on a family member or a family member may become upset at the veteran for not telling a certain story or telling it just like they remember hearing it before or maybe getting a date wrong or something. So want to visit with the veteran and their family if at all to make sure they understand that they can be in the room and they can listen. Uh, they can chime in every once in a while, but the camera will stay on the veteran. So talk to the family and the veteran during that pre-interview if you have that opportunity to do so, just so they understand the the parameters. Uh, other things you want to make sure you talk to your veteran about is that when you come back for the interview, make sure it's not during a time that they have an appointment at the VA or they're having to bring grandchildren or, uh, it's or it's time for them to eat. Make sure that when the interview is scheduled, all those things are taken care of because you want to make make sure you're taken care of but more that veteran interview a big big thing i want you to think about is ask your veteran to dig up old from when they served in the military it is the best thing that you can do for this process old pictures are great to stir up their memory and sometimes when a veteran gets nervous they can speak from those pictures picture and they can turn it around to the camera and they will tell you about that picture and it kind of calms them down. The pictures again are great to straight to have close by to help you with your interview and then one thing I love 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 to do is to um, have the veteran find the oldest picture they can find of them in uniform while they're the their youngest picture in a frame or leaned up on a side table by their chair. So when you're, you have the veteran in the frame plus that picture of them, maybe at 18 years, here they are at 92. It just makes a good um, uh, picture in your video when you're in a veteran. It also gives you, again, something else to talk about. If a veteran has old uniforms or a shadow box with their medals that they received while in the military, any, any military paraphernalia that they may have that they would like to share during the interview, please ask them to have that ready when you come back for the interview. Also, like a uniform can be placed behind them or beside them, so it's a background during the interview. So you can just brainstorm a veteran to see what's going to be working best for them. Uh, as I go through this today, I will share with you some things that I leave with the veteran at the time, uh, and, and I'll show it to you when we pull up those screens. But right now, during the during the pre-interview, I leave with them the interview questions, the biographical data form, and the veterans release form, and that just gives them time to read over all that material and be comfortable for when you come back for the interview. My rule of thumb on scheduling the actual interview is that I try to make it the same time as the pre-interview, so I know what the lighting is like, I know what my veteran is like at that time of day, and I, about a week later, I try to come back and do the actual interview. So that gives the veteran time to prepare. Do we have any questions at this, this point on anything I've covered? OK, 
Okay, if not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going on. Um, so now let's talk a little bit more about, um, Sarah, are you there? Can you pull up, can you pull up the Senator's website? Sure. Okay. Oh. So click on services. This is Senator Bozeman's website, and I'm just going to and go down the Veterans History Project. Okay. So I'm just showing you this website. You can go out here on your own, um, and I want to show you just some ideas that your school can do too. So after we interview a veteran, and you can stop right there, Sarah, for now. Um, so there's a little bit about it, and then um, we interview a veteran, and while we're interviewing, we also get permission to use his excerpts of the interview out on different social media platforms. So this is an example that you can go out and take a look at some of the interviews that we've done before. And again, these are excerpts of interviews. They're not the whole interview. And when you do the interview, you cannot edit. And I'll stress that over and over. So Sarah, just kind of scroll on down a little bit. Thank you. So right here, you see there's a clip of a 100-year-old veteran recently interviewed for Magazine Arkansas, and he was a prisoner of war. Uh, and, and again, you see his medals there beside him. He did not have a picture. And we have up on this website, the last three veterans that we've highlighted, the Senator does a uh, salute to veterans once a month. Sarah, if you can show the next one, there we go. So this, the third gentleman here, um, yes, he was 99 years old. He was in hospice care and we were called on a Friday. Could we run up to Jonesboro and interview him? He was literally on his deathbed. He had cancer, he had Alzheimer's, um, and uh, didn't have but a few days left to live. But he gave a beautiful interview, and his family did attend in that hospital room there. You can't see the family, but they uh, encircled the entire room, and they were very respectful during his interview. Sarah, if you'll scroll on down just a tiny bit there, um, so there's a laundry list here of other Arkansas veterans that we've interviewed. And you can click on any of those and it will bring up the press release that we sent out and then an excerpt of the interview. See, Sarah just clicked on one to show you what each of them will have. So again, I just share with you um, what some of ours look like. And see, you see pictures there of uh, Mr. Heffley that are beside him. And you see in his case, the lighting's not so good. Uh, it, was, it was late evening when, or late afternoon when we uh, interviewed him and we didn't have his chair turned around facing the window, but the lighting was not very good. We, we should have, could have worked on his a little bit better, but like I tell everybody, good enough is good enough. If we haven't, hadn't have interviewed him, he might not have had his, his experiences preserved in the Library of Congress. All right, Sarah, thank you for that. If you could, uh, Sarah, if you could go ahead and click on the Library of Congress Veterans History Project website. Okay. And uh, this, this website, after I've shared with you today, if you uh, forget anything I've told you, there is a, a BHP Field Kit Companion video. It lasts about 15, 16 minutes, and it goes over everything that we're gonna talk about today. It just does it in a much shorter time. Um, you can click on search the veterans, and let's say, uh, I didn't remember everybody, Sarah Keehan, John Bozeman, B-O-O-Z-M-A-N. And you'll see these are all the interviews that Senator Bozeman's office in the last four and a half years that we have interviewed veterans and had them put into the Library of Congress. And I believe there's something around 54 or something that's already in the Library of Congress 
The good news is we've trained over 1,200 people in Arkansas. And when we started this project in, in 2015, there were 1,100 Arkansans in the Library of Congress. And that number is now 1,600. So in the last five years, um, four and a half, five years, we've bumped that number up in Arkansas, 500 more. So we're, we're doing good things in Arkansas. So you can look somebody's name up if you know the name of the veteran or if you know the name of the interviewer, or if you know the name of the organization. So I encourage you when you do the Library of Congress Veterans History Project and you fill out the paperwork that you continue to put the name of the organization, uh, contributor organization, you'll see there it says John Bozeman or US Senator John Bozeman. And I put that consistently on the paperwork and that way I can just pull up my boss's name and get everybody that the office has submitted. The, you notice on the, the one that Sarah has pulled up, it has the interviewer is Marley Bird. Marley Bird was an a, a intern for Senator Bozeman's office from Hendricks College. Uh, so she came to work with us for a semester and, and worked on the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Okay, uh, Sarah, if you'd be so kind as to go to the PDF so we can look at the actual field kit. Are there any questions about anything covered so far? Yes, we do have one question. It says, uh, what if the veteran is a family member? That's even better. You can have great access to them. So absolutely, you can interview your family member. And uh, uh, actually, if a veteran wishes to self-interview, they can do that too. But absolutely, we encourage you to, uh, to interview your family members. Good question. And then another question is, how many interviews do you do at one time? Uh, another good question. You interview one veteran at a time. And everything you do from paperwork to the flash drive or DVD-R, whatever you do, you do one for one, no multiples. You are not allowed to do group interviews for the Veterans History Project, just one at a time. All right, I don't think we have any more questions. So if you wanna continue going through the toolkit with us. Okay. Um, so, Sarah, can you go to page three? We pretty much covered the other two pages already. Very good. Step two. Yes. Okay. okay. There on page three, what I want to highlight, if you can scroll down to where it says uh, 30, 20, 10. Yeah, keep, keep going until that's all on the screen, please. There you go. All right, the rule here, the 30, 20, 10, it can be confusing, but uh, it's, it's not as complicated as it kind of looks because first people at first glance said, oh my goodness, I have to do each of those. But actually you only have to do one of those, but you do have to meet one of those requirements. For example, I focus in on the 30 minute minimum length interview. And I actually encourage you to do more than 30 minutes. Uh, I try to never let my interviews go over about an hour and a half. Uh, just because the veteran will get tired, you'll get tired, and you want to kind of keep the interview fresh. Somebody who served 30 years has more than an hour and a half worth of stories to tell, but you can do subsequent interviews. And one veteran can be interviewed multiple times by different people even, or the same person. But the first requirement is on the 30, 20, 10 rule is that you must meet the 30 minute length of an audio or video interview. And that's actually 30 unedited minutes. Your videos, can, your interviews cannot be edited. I stress that real strong because if it is edited, it will be sent back. I also do encourage a little more than 30 minutes at least. I uh, had one school down in South Arkansas that they were stopping it right at 30 minutes and it turned out that the timer on their camera was a couple of minutes off. 
and their, their interviews were rejected by the Library of Congress. So 30 minute interview. All right, the next, let's say you have a veteran that doesn't want to be interviewed, but they do have uh, their memoir or a diary or journal that they kept while they were uh, in the military. And so if they are willing to submit their original memoir, diary, or journal, it has to be original to go into the Library of Congress. It then has to be a minimum of 20 pages. So I'll give you an example of a memoir that we were fortunate to get here in Little Rock. I had a veteran uh, that, that didn't want to be interviewed. He wanted his uh, father to be highlighted, but his father was deceased. And these are first person interviews. But in his case, his father had, um, it was a lovely story. His father had been drafted uh, uh, and, and survived the war, came home, but was killed in a car accident two years later. The mother then raised the five children on her own. She never remarried. When the mother passed away at 86 years old, I think she was, the family, when they were cleaning out the house, they found under her bed a box of love letters. Um, her husband had written her almost every day he had been deployed overseas during World War II. So there was like I want to say 294 letters, something like that. So the, the youngest son took the next several years of his life and put all those letters together in a, in a book. He also, as information became declassified, included those in the, that information in the book. And he made 50 copies for the family. Because that was not a published memoir, a published book, then we got to put it into the Library of Congress Veterans History Project for that family. So that was a beautiful win. So that's what a 20, an example of a 20 page situation. Um, and then the last thing is if you have a veteran that doesn't want to interview, doesn't have a memoir, diary, or journal, but they do have a minimum of 10 original pictures that they're willing, or letters, um, and it lists that there are pieces of artwork and so on, but they have a minimum of 10 of those. Uh, and it would have to be 10 each, like 10 photographs or 10 letters. Then that could submit, you, that could be submitted as a, a collection for that veteran and you would meet that requirement. So that gets a little confusing. So let's go back up. Let's say you interviewed a veteran for 15 minutes and they said, okay, that's all I can do. That wouldn't fit the criteria because they hasn't met the minimum of 30 minutes. But if they came back to you and said, I, I do have 10 original photographs I can give you for, for this submission, it would make it a win because you could still submit that 15 minutes of video, but it would be made whole because you've got the 10 minim, minimum of original photographs. Uh, often we can do an interview for uh, over the 30 minutes, say an hour and a half or so, and the veteran will say, hey, I have these, these two photographs here and they're almost just alike. Would you like one of those? And the answer is yes. I would love to put that one that you're willing to give me and put it into the Library of Congress. So once you've hit the minimum requirement of any of those, then you can give less or more or none of the others. So that's pretty kind of complicated. So if you do have questions about that, let me know. And then also I want to point out at the bottom of the page there that um, the Veterans History Project can be used for Eagle Scout or Gold Star for Boy, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. And that's, that's a big deal. We've kind of got that kind of going pretty good in Northwest Arkansas now, but I hope that spreads like wildfire across the state. Uh, they have to do more than just one interview. There's a whole series of things they have to do for their project. Uh, and if we want to talk about that later, we certainly can. Any questions? Yeah, we have a couple. Um, one question is, can we do this over the phone since the circumstances or because of the circumstances? That is a great question. And just, just so you know, I was on the phone with the, uh, the people in DC asking these types of questions. 
uh, this morning at a five o'clock. And unfortunately, they haven't come to a conclusion on that. They are exploring opportunities, possibilities, but right now uh, they don't accept uh, interviews except person to person. Um, and, and speaking of that, they, they just highly encourage that everybody continue to practice the social distancing guidelines put out by the CDC. So try to interview those people that you're quarantined with at this point in time, but they're not accepting, because I ask about FaceTime, I ask about Zoom, I ask about Skype, and at this time, they're still not accepting that type, but they are exploring that avenue. If that changes, I'll, I'll let you know. Another question is, what are some of the cameras that we should use? And I will, if you don't mind holding off on that particular one, I'll kind of talk about that a little bit later. Okay. And remind me if I, if I miss, miss telling you that. Okay. Sarah, if you could go ahead and go to page four. Yeah, yes. Okay, right there. On page four of the field kit, and the field kit is really just a, a booklet that you can download from that website or you can actually order from the Library of Congress. And then I have some on hand here in Arkansas. But I want to point out to you right there is don't move, Sarah. Um, you cannot use the U.S. Postal Service to mail your packet in when you get this all, all put together. And the re I know that sounds crazy, but the reason you can't use the U.S. Postal Service is that anything going to the Hill, to the Library of Congress in D.C., it, it, all those documents are scanned. And if you have in your packet a DVD or a flash drive going through that scanner, it's probably going to damage it. So the way you get your packets to the Library of Congress is by using one of those three options there, or two options, um, using FedEx, UPS, or hand deliver. And hand deliver, if you do get the chance to go to DC, you can make an appointment with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. You can carry your packet there, and they will take a picture of you turning it over to them. They often post that out on their social media. Um, Senator Bozeman has done that on a couple of occasions, and we certainly post that out to let, let everyone know of the success from Arkansas. Uh, so if you do get to make a trip, that is a great thing to do. Veterans can also, if they're going to the DC area, can contact the Library of Congress and actually do an interview there in their office. But we, for the most part, we send everything up FedEx or UPS. All right, if there are no questions about that, we'll go to, uh, Let's go to page six, please. Okay, cover letter. So what I recommend for the cover letter, uh, you can use what you see there, and it implies that you can uh, put more names and everything uh, for your interviews on that one cover letter, and you can do that. I don't encourage it because I try to keep everything a little separate. Um, it just makes it clear, because you can imagine the volume that they get into the Library of Congress. Uh, so I try to just do one for each one. So you can use this cover letter and fill it out like it is, or what I would really encourage you to do is to use your school's letterhead or East Initiative letterhead or if you're doing this through your church or your scout troop, whatever your letterhead is, I encourage you to use your letterhead. And Sarah, if you can scroll back up to the top, um, here it says, uh, and it gets so confusing, uh, if you get confused about who's the donor, um, just mark out donor and say, hey, I, I was the interviewer and the organization I'm with is East Initiative or whatever your high school is. So don't, don't get gnarled around the actual about those type of things. If you don't know what donor means or whatever, just scratch it out, put who the interviewer was and what organization you're with. What's your school's name? What's, what, whatever, what's your church's name? What's your name? If it's just an individual, you put the same thing for both. The veteran's name comes down here. 
So this cover letter is just a reminder, as you see, it has a checklist down here to make sure that you're including everything that's required for your packet. And then you sign off on the bottom. Okay. So yes, Sarah's going to the next page and that's exactly right. So at the next page here, the biographical data form, as you see, it shows required. The cover letter is required too, but it doesn't have required listed on that cover page we were just at but a cover letter is required. So the biographical data form is something that I leave with the veteran and their family when I do the pre-interview. And I ask them to try and fill this out before I get back. So most times they don't, but uh, I do ask them to, to take a look at it because it's also pieces of it will help during the interview. This is required. You have to print, this out or type this out, I print, and uh, everything, you cannot use abbreviations. So if you have a difficult time uh, understanding all the military jargon, you can Google a lot, a lot of it and figure it out. But if you still have trouble, give me a shout and I'll help you with that. You know, for example, uh, it shows battalion there. Abbreviation for battalion in the army is BN. But they don't want you to put BN, they would want you to spell battalion out. So where you find this information, and Sarah, if you can go just back to the top so we keep biographical data form on our minds. Uh, this is the most important document in the packet that you're gonna provide. Where this information comes from is the Veterans Report of Separation. And there are kind of a few different forms that that comes from in their military records, but the one I want you to focus on is a DD form 214. DD stands for Department of Defense, 214. That is kind of the most common one you see. There are different ones. For example, World War II veterans, um, their form, their report of separation was called a WD AGO 53-55 is the most common one. And WD stood for War Department back then. And AGO is for Adjutant General's Office. So if you don't remember any of that, you look on the form that says report of separation. And it may also include report of enlistment and separation, but it will say the word separation. And everything you see here will be included on that form. Another reason why I just really want you to look, make sure they have that form is kind of twofold. It's not required for you to, to have a copy of that document, the report of separation, to do the interview. But it's very important because it does prove they served, so there's no stolen valor. And it also, at the time of the veteran's death in the future, the family will be required to have that form to turn into the funeral home director for the veteran to receive military funeral honors. So if the veteran you're, you're working with does not have that form, you can still do the interview, but I ask you to get back with me or the county veteran service officer or a veteran service organization somewhere to request that they are given a copy of their report of separation because the family will need it in the future. Any, any questions? And you fill this form out as best you can. Sometimes you, will, you won't have all, all the information that it asks for. Uh, one question about the form is, do we have to fill out the death date if they aren't dead? No, this would be in a case, uh, for example, if you're, in, you're a gold, interviewing a Gold Star family member and uh, the immediate next to Ken, you're interviewing the, the say the mother of a son that, that died, then you would have a date of death. So usually that's not applicable. Uh, in the case of, I showed you the, the veteran that I was asked to interview that was on his deathbed, before I could get his packet fully put together, he passed away. So then I had a date of death that I, I had to show on this form. So those, that's some examples. Okay. Anything else, Sarah? 
Um, we have some general questions and we're 15 minutes to one o'clock. So I don't know if you want to take a couple more minutes to talk more about the packet or Let, go ahead and dive. Yeah, Sarah, let's keep going and then we'll enter, uh, get those questions at the end. Gotcha. So keep scrolling. The next page is just a continuation of, of the uh, biographical data form. If you have additional information you, that, you know, so you have somebody that served 30 years, they may have a lot of information to share. Um, also, if you have somebody who has even more information to share, you can put extra type written um, forms that you make or, or uh, information lists or whatever to put in for the biogra biographical data information. For example, I interviewed a female who was the first command sergeant major of the Arkansas Army National Guard. So she had, uh, well, she actually served over 40 years and she had a lot of information. She broke a lot of glass ceilings. So we had several pages that we added to the biographical data form. Okay, you can keep going. Please go to page nine. Okay, the veterans release form. This is another document that I give to the veteran during the pre-interview during the preparation part. And I just say, please read over this. And then when I come back for the interview, you know, I'm gonna collect all these forms I'm giving you now, but I don't start the interview without this form being signed. Because that way I know that they have read over the, this form and have agreed to be interviewed for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. And it's a very simple form. Uh, and what it really means is that they do not, as a veteran, you don't lose your copyright privileges. So if somebody comes back later and wants to use your interview, like Ken Burns, the documentarist, who, do, who has used some Veterans History Project uh, veterans for his, his documentaries, uh, they have to come back to the veteran and ask permission, whether it's a book, a movie, a documentary. If the veteran is deceased, they have to come back to the family to get permission. Okay, next page. All right, the next page is the interviewer's release form. So that's gonna be you. If you're the person doing the interview, you would fill this out. So your 15, uh, 15 year old student or above would fill this form out, uh, giving permission for them to use his, his or her information in the Library of Congress. And you can just fill it out later when you're putting the packet together. Okay, go on to the next page. All right, audio and video recording log. So this is fairly self-explanatory. And uh, let's talk about cameras now. Um, I have, and I don't have it in here with me, I have an old Canon video camera that was here at this office when I got here. It is old, but it works. So uh, that's what I use. Some people use the new, uh, new cameras where you can interview on your, your actual uh, camera, <laughs> not a video camera, but your camera that has video capability. And that's okay too. Just be aware that after so many minutes, and I wanna say it's something like 30 minutes, it will shut off, but you can, uh, I think, turn it back on again and keep interviewing but the camera uh, automatically shuts off at a certain time. Uh, some people do try to do interviews with uh, iPhone or iPad, and you can do that, but I will tell you, you have to have a ton of free space and it will burn through a battery. And I do recommend whatever type of camera that you use, um, plug it up, plug it up, just in case your batteries aren't as good as you think they are. So any kind of camera works okay. Uh, the video camera that I have here, again, it's just a Canon camera, nothing special at all. You probably have much better equipment than I do. Uh, will work fine. Uh, there you see um, the video type. Well, yeah, let's, let's go back up so I'll make sure I don't miss anything here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think item three, uh, for your videos, I use DVD-Rs is what I use. And the only reason that I'm using those is that they're the cheapest. 
And so from a congressional office standpoint, best, cheapest is the way we're going. So I use the DVD-R. The, the flash drives, their prices have come down quite a bit. So a lot of people are starting to use flash drives. You can use anything that's listed there. If you use something other than that, then you would put it in the other block. Um, during my time of being involved with this project, I've only had one veteran that uh, did not want to be videotaped, so we did uh, audio on him and did a CDR for his interview. If you'll scroll on down to uh, the digital file in item four, those are the file types that they use. I use the MP4 primarily for mine. Item five is pretty self-explanatory. You just put how long your interview was in minutes and the date of the recording, the location of the recording. And then in item eight, and uh, this is the minute mark. And so Sarah, if you'll keep scrolling, it goes to the, to the minute mark pages. People at this point start panicking about, oh my gosh, I have to write something for every minute of the interview. So the answer to that is no, you don't. You only have to, uh, when you have a change of subject or a very uh, important story that the interview or the veteran shared during the interview, you put the minute mark on the left side or the time of the minute mark on the left and then just what it was about. So say minute one is the introduction, they talk about their childhood. Uh, minute five is they're at basic training uh, or boot camp it says on that one. Minute 15, they're talking about being in the Battle of the Bulge. And this is for researchers. Say you had somebody that wanted to research our Kansans that were in the Battle of the Bulge. They could more easily find that in the interview instead of having to look through the whole interview for that one piece. All right, we'll keep going. And Sarah, if you'll go to photo log. There you go. So on the photo log, uh, again, you don't have to have a photo unless uh, your veteran wants to give you one, unless you're using it to meet a minimum requirement, unless you're using photographs to meet a minimum requirement. If you do, then it's a minimum of 10 original photographs. So if you, you have a interview that's 45 minutes long, you don't have to have a photograph too. But if they should give you one, or if you're using it to meet a minimum, here's, here's what you do. This, this again is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, at the top it says that each picture should be labeled. This is a Anita thing. I don't write on a photograph. I just don't do it because I'm afraid I'm going to damage it. So I put, uh, and I don't have a total example here, but I put on the uh, on, I put the photograph in an envelope, and on the outside, I always put the name and date of birth of the veteran. And then on the outside of the envelope, I would also write the location, the date, and the description of the what's on, on the photograph. So if I have ten photographs, I have ten envelopes. I put them separately, uh, or bigger envelopes if you have bigger pictures. Um, all right, Sarah, keep going to the next page. All right, manuscripts. So I spoke about the memoir that we turned in. I only had to enter one place on this document. Um, and you can scroll through there a little bit, Sarah, and, sh and show that you it's just you share about all the different uh, manuscripts that you may have. Recently, we, we submitted an interview plus a manuscript, and it was a, a veteran that had years ago topped up his, his memory of his time in the service. So we included it during uh, putting the packet together. And then every time you add, if you're adding photographs or you're adding manuscripts, then those pages in this uh, field kit become required. But if you're not submitting manuscripts, you're not submitting uh, photographs, then you do not have to include them in your packet. Uh, one thing I want to go back on that I forgot to share, Sarah, is uh, 
on the when you're submitting your DVD-R or your flash drive. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thank you, Sarah. Am I still there, Sarah? Yes, you're still here. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, on your, I put my DVD R in a, uh, a a case, or if I don't have a case, I'll put it in an envelope. But on the outside of whatever I do that's separate from the packet, that could get separated from the packet, I should say, I always put name and date of birth. And that is just in case if it gets separated, we can get them put back together. On the DVD, and if you have a flash drive, stick it in an envelope with name and date of birth. On the DVD R itself, we are so used to taking a marker and writing on that disc. Um, do not do that because over time that ink can sound into that disc. So they don't want us to use uh, any ink uh, or any felt tip on the DVDs, right on the outside of the case or on the outside of the sleeve. All right, Sarah, you can you can go back all the way to page 16. Okay. And we're about three minutes to one. Do you want to take this time to answer some questions real quick? Yeah. Absolutely, and the last two pages, 16 and 17, are just the do's and don'ts, a little more information for you, so you betcha. Uh, what are some of the questions, please? Yes, and um, guys, I'm gonna be putting this, all these links in the chat as well, so you can have access to them. But um, one question is, when interviewing a veteran, how do you figure out what triggers their PTSD? Can you ask one of their family members so that you can avoid triggering them? So you can do that, absolutely. Uh, and that question often comes up. And remember I told you that um, another part of your field kit is interview questions. Uh, often giving these questions, and, and you don't have to use all these questions. You can use some of them, none of them, some of them, uh, or all of them. But giving them the questions in advance helps with them and helps settle them down and they're ready to go. Almost anybody doing an interview is a little nervous at first, but they settle down. Uh, if you say something, for example, I, I interviewed a Vietnam veteran and they, he said, I'd be happy to interview you, but I'm not gonna talk about my experience in Vietnam. I said, yes, sir. And so we talked about everything he wanted to talk about. Because I did not pressure him, he ended up talking about his time in Vietnam and was glad that he did. Uh, uh, I have never had a veteran to say that the interview upset them. Almost every one of them had said they wished they had talked before. So it's a very healthy thing for our veterans. It's a release for them. It's healthy, healthy for the families because they learn things about their veteran they never knew. It usually brings families and veterans closer together. All right, thank you. Um, next question. Can um, this be counted as a history credit? So that would be up to your teacher, but I'll, I'll share with you what some other schools are doing. Uh, this, the Veterans History Project is pretty much a plug and play project. Uh, it, some teachers have used it in their history classes, researchers, journalism, uh, videography, communications in the English class, classes. It is truly a plug and play and your, your teacher makes that determination about uh, how best to use this in their class. Okay. Um, do you have the exact date of when the photo, do you have to have the exact date of when the photograph was taken to be counted? Yeah, good, very good question. And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, I had a veteran from post-war Japan provide nearly, a, uh, I, I bet there was 50 photographs, and he didn't remember much about any of them. So he gave what information he could remember, and that's how we submitted them to the Veterans History Project, and that was good enough. 
Um, if they had lost a medal, should we bring it up? I'm guessing, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I love this one. Uh, you guys need to go out, uh, just Google the, the most recent VFW magazine, Veterans of Foreign Wars magazine, and you'll find an article about Strawberry, Arkansas, Hillcrest High School students and what all they did with the Veterans History Project. And one of the things is, uh, when I teach this, this in class, is that we kind of drill down a little more. And yes, if you have a veteran that's had their medals lost, misplaced, stolen, burned in a fire, whatever, uh, let us know. Um, there's various ways how to get replacement sets of federal medals. We do it all the time. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And that's what we did with the student at Hillcrest and as a surprise presented those medals to that veteran at a big community event. It was a beautiful thing. And then it says, should we talk about when they got a medal and when they did, like when it was awarded? I'm assuming with the video, should they talk about when they got their medal? So uh, all your questions should be open-ended. Make sure of that. They're open-ended. Don't, don't pin them down to a yes or no. And don't pin them down to date, remembering dates. This is about their experience, how they felt, what they thought. So if they want to talk about their medals, right. Uh, like the, the veteran um, that you saw that had the shadow box of all their medals. Often I do not pin them down about medals because they may feel uncomfortable. They may be very uh, humble and don't want to talk about how they got that bronze star. But if they want to talk about it, great, but I don't push it. And then this last question, um, I believe it's asking, so if let's say you're taking a video and then you have to stop in the middle of the interview, it says that you used to have to name like the location and then when you were continuing, is that still the case? Yeah, so uh, at the beginning of your interview, you do want to go through the introduction. And so you would say something like your, your name, uh, who you're with, the date, because you want to time date stamp your interview and you want to say the location, not address, but like city of Maumelle um, in Arkansas. It's time date stamp that your interview and that you are there to interview so and so. If during the interview you have to take a break for anything, for example, if a veteran begins to become upset and they want to take a break, then you just say, we're going to take a short break and you stop your video. That's not editing. Stopping is not editing. And then once the veteran uh, has had a minute to kind of gain their composure and they're okay and they're ready to go again, then you turn it back on and you just say, we're back from our break. And you continue, continue your interview. When you're downloading the, to your, to burning, burning it to your DVD-R, your flash drive, that's gonna be in them two parts. Every time you start and stop your, your camera, in my case, then I have a different uh, frame that I have to pull off and, and download uh, when I'm burning it to my disk. All right. Well, it is 103. Thank you so much, Colonel Deason, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. Thank you again for this opportunity. I, I really appreciate it. Appreciate your interest. It's awesome. a beautiful program. Beautiful. It is. Um, and guys, if you can see in the chat, I posted um, a link to our survey to let us know um, how we did on all of this fun stuff. Um, and then I also linked uh, all the resources that we went over uh, on the Veterans History Project in the webinar. If you have any questions or you want to get in contact to, with Colonel Deason, just email me at Sarah at eaststaff.org, and we appreciate you guys again. Thanks so much.